four, three, two, one. Boom, boom, boom. Super Predator after Super Predator. Not just falling down, but staying down. So many people thought Maxwell was going to get out and skip the country and live happily ever after in a yellow submarine. It has not happened. And we have got Fred back with us because it's just brilliant news story after brilliant news story. We know we had Nygaard, we had Jean-Luc Brunel, Max, Max, Maxwell's bail getting denied, and on and on it goes. And I, I just can't think of a better way to end this year. And it's a huge credit, and they must be just absolutely rejoicing to all of the survivors of Epstein, talking Maria, Farmer, Virginia, Roberts, Kirby Summers. I'm going to be putting all of the... Twitter handles in the description box and I urge people to send them notes of congratulations. And <laughs> while I just share the link for the live stream and we get deeply into the ruling and all of the other legal stuff around what's just happened, I'm just gonna hand this over to Fred and he's just gonna give you an update on the latest news. Thanks, Fred. Fantastic. Thank you very much for having me, Sean. And uh, obviously a fantastic news. I mean, we we were all, all holding our breath, you know, over this uh, stunt because I cannot call it uh, this uh, a second uh, attempt uh, to, uh, to to free Maxwell and uh, this uh, bell hearing was just a complete media stunt. So absolutely no meat in that whatsoever. So I was quite confident, but obviously with the justice system in the United States, you want to uh, to be cautious and making sure that you understand you understand the principles behind the ruling. So we we all obviously enjoy and rejoice with this great news. She belongs behind bars. She's a threat to society, and more importantly, she's a very, very high flight risk person. We saw that in July, the judge Nathan ruled against basically uh, uh, an early uh, an early bail basically allowed them to live freely in the United States awaiting for a trial. Well, this is not going to happen. And the reason, and one of the reasons uh, why it's not going to happen, uh, Sean, is simply because this um, investigation on Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell cost millions to the, the American uh, taxpayers. And that's obviously something that they have to take in, into consideration because if you was to evade the justice system, like our dear friend Jean-Luc Brunel did on so many occasions, that will be very, very difficult. And I think after Jeffrey Epstein, societal, uh, whatever we want to call it, uh, they can simply not afford for her to, to flee uh, the justice. So excellent uh, news for the victims, as you just said, because at the end of the day, all this is about uh, bringing uh, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell to trial, making sure she's going to be a judge for the crimes she's been accused of and then uh, we are looking obviously at uh, the proposal that she was made because it was hilarious I mean they, they've offered so much money they've offered so many uh, technical aspects having electronic monitoring and so on that we can see they were basically throwing at the judge everything they had hoping maybe for clemency but uh, thanks God it did not happen so I'm delighted for that Sean. Brilliant. What I'm going to do then is so that everybody can fully understand what the judges said. I'm going to read the actual ruling next. Mm. So let me just pull this up. It's not a long one. It's only two pages. It's two pages. It's correct. been published um, on various uh, platforms, and I'm, I'm drawing this off a platform called Law and Crime. So it mm. says... United States of America versus Ghislaine Maxwell defendant. Allison Nathan, district judge. On December 8, 2020, defendant Ghislaine Maxwell filed a renewed motion for release on bail. In an opinion and order concurrently filed under temporary seal, the court denies the defendant's motion. So a lot of people have been confused about this. They thought that Maxwell had a bail hearing yesterday and a bail was denied. And I would have loved to have 
listened in on that because as we know they they broadcast there's an audio available to to listen to on that what actually happened is the judge has just denied maxwell from having a hearing because nothing the same that nothing's changed even though yeah. maxwell's pros, um, team have put forward all these reasons that things have changed but we're going to get to that in light Absolutely. of the fact that the opinion includes potentially confidential information that should not be filed on the public docket, the court will permit the parties 48 hours to propose any redactions to the court's opinion and order, and to justify those redactions by reference to the Second Circuit's decision in Lugosh versus Pyramid. After determining which, if any, portions of the opinion and order should be redacted, the court will file the opinion and order on the public docket. This order provides the bottom line of the court's resolution. On July 14, 2020, this court conducted an extensive bail hearing and determined that pre-trial detention was warranted because no conditions or set of conditions could reasonably assure the defendant's appearance at future proceedings. Under 18 USC, a bail hearing may be reopened if the court finds, quote, that information exists that was not known to the movement at the time of the hearing, and that has a material bearing on the issue, whether there are conditions of release that will reasonably assure the appearance of such person as required, quotation marks closed. The court concludes that none of the new information that the defendant presented in support of application has a material bearing on the court's determination that she poses a flight risk. Furthermore, for substantially the same reasons as the court determined that detention was warranted in the initial bail hearing, the court again concludes that no conditions of release can reasonably assure the defendant's appearance at future proceedings. In reaching that conclusion, the court considers the nature and circumstances of the offenses charged. Yes, the weight of the evidence against the defendant the history and characteristics of the defendant and the nature and seriousness of the danger that the defendant's release would pose. The government does not contend that the defendant poses a danger to the community. Nonetheless, the court determines that the other three factors warrant detention. The court also finds that the defendant's proposed bail conditions would not reasonably assure her appearance at future proceedings. As a, result, as a result, the court concludes that the government has met its burden of persuasion that the defendant poses a flight risk and that pre-trial detention continues to be warranted. On or before December 30th, 2020, the parties are ordered to submit a joint letter indicating whether they propose any redactions and the justification for any such proposals. So, um, look at those four factors, Fred. The judge here is saying the first three are relevant. Can you expand on those? Do you want me to repeat them or? Yeah, can you repeat them? Because it was a lot of information and uh, okay. I just come out of Christmas, you know. <laughs> <laughs> My head is still spinning a little bit. <laughs> a lot of celebration, as you know, you know, with our little Brunel going down. So, we, yeah. So, I'm, I'm just, uh, and your voice is kind of attacking me, you know, like, wow, this is great. <laughs> <It's happening. laughs> but hammering, hammering that French wide, no doubt. Um, yeah. in, re in, in reaching the conclusion, the court considers the nature and circumstances of the offences charged is factor one. The weight of the evidence against the defendant is factor two. The history and characteristics of the defendant is factor three. So the judge is saying that the fourth factor, um, the nature and seriousness of the, of the danger that she her release would pose is is not what a factor in here. It's the first three factors are why the judge made this decision. Absolutely, uh, Sean. I think what we need to re remember to remind ourselves is that uh, during the first uh, hearing and the judge Nathan made it extremely clear that uh, Maxwell pleaded not guilty, not for one count of charges, you know, but we're talking about six charges 
you know, six charges accusing her of grooming and abusing children, being part of a sex trafficking ring. I mean, we're talking about some very, very serious uh, allegations, accusations and charges here. I mean, she could spend 35 years behind behind the bars, you know, if the charges are held against her and uh, she's found guilty. So because of that, I think, uh, you know, that's exactly what she's saying. She's like, uh, nothing has changed in, 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 in that respect, you know. Not, she, they are not bringing anything new that will demonstrate that some of the charges would not stick any longer. I think before they arrested her, they had some real serious evidence that she was guilty of these crimes. And that's the reason, one of the reasons why this has not changed. The second reason, obviously, will be that uh, uh, they reached the conclusion that uh, uh, she's... Um, She's a, she's a serious fly, flight risk. And I've just mentioned that from, from, from the get go. Passports, I mean, 12 accounts around the world. They're talking about three passports. I believe she has five passports from my investigation. They do not mention an Israeli passport, but I strongly suspect her of having an Israeli passport. So again, you know, the French passport is enough for her to basically regain uh, France and not been basically been able uh, to face justice in the United States. That will be absolutely uh, a, a no-go for the uh, US justice system again. So that is the second reason why nothing has changed in that sense. She still has the passport. She still has the financial means. And more importantly, she has great connections around the world that will help or escape. So there you go. You you have a judge that doesn't want to take any risk. And it's like, you know, if you're going to be, uh, I will compare it clearly to someone that gets um, a second trial or someone that will, uh, a lawyer that's going to ask a second trial, a second chance to retrial someone. You need to bring new evidence, something that's going to support your claim, that's going to allow the judge to change his mind and say, yes, there are new evidences, there are new factors that allows me to say yes, and then to grant a new hearing. But as you just said, <laughs> the hearing was not even granted. They just threw, it, they threw, the, they threw the, the request completely out of the window. It was not entertained. And that's what exactly what happened. And then something that perhaps I could add, uh, which I think is quite interesting, is with regards to the marriage, you know, it's been a big question from day one as far as she's led Maxwell concerned. People wanted to know if she was married. There was doubt. There was obviously no marriage certificate. So we needed to be cautious. And then the news come up eventually that she is indeed married. But in the middle of this uh, request for a belly hearing, she's announcing that she's in the process of divorce. So again, that, you know, raised the suspicion as far as to why Borgeson will put so much money towards, uh, you know, uh, a bell hearing on the basis that they're going to divorce. It just doesn't make sense. Or he would say simply that the money that he was prepared to put on the table is Shislaine Maxwell's money. So, Fred, we've just had one of Epstein's victims, survivors, let's rephrase that. One of Epstein's survivors joined the chat and um, I'm going to read you what Kirby Summers here has said. I've recently been reading some of the research she's been doing. She's been doing fantastic research about the, oh, the link great. to Iran-Contra and um, Epstein and the cartels and going back years with the CIA and all this other stuff. So, Kirby, thanks for joining the live chat. Urge people to support Kirby as well as the, as the other victims and survivors. And um, she's put part of Ghislaine Maxwell's proposal to the court included waiving her right of extradition from France. Are you aware of this? Yes, it's actually part of the negotiations. I mean, it's a stunt again, you know, it's uh, I've, I've, I don't believe it's ever been done before. I've never heard of this, but uh, yes, I can concur that Kirby is saying absolutely what she's saying is true. That was part of the, the negotiation with uh, Bobby Sternheim. She, uh, she's very she's a top lawyer. I mean, you got you can't get a better lawyer in New York, you know. Say, so, uh, yes, Kirby is absolutely right. There was no way 
uh, Maxwell uh, could have asked for any any kind of a bell unless the condition that uh, you know she would surrender a French passport and she will not flee back to France. So, but yet again, it's irrelevant because she has many passports. And yet again, <laughs> if she needs to disappear, she has the means to do so. So it doesn't really add up to to a change of conditions as far as the risk she uh, she offers. So she's gesturing that she was going to behave herself, but really, it's all it's all a, it's all a charade. It, it, it is a charade, and I think uh, we can say that uh, is glad. I'm great Kirby is here because she's uh, probably one of the most, uh, uh, you know, precise researcher out there, and she's done some really some amazing stuff. You know, a lot of you know politics in the world of who's right, who's wrong, but. We shouldn't care about that. What we care about is the quality of the informations. And she'll say the things the way they are. And I appreciate her for that very much. You know, Sam, we are taking all the information very cautiously. We need to be very careful because the amount of disinformation out there is unbelievable. So we need to remain quiet sometimes, do the digging, do the research, making sure that we understand exactly what's going on. And uh, I'm glad we have, uh, you know, people like Kirby out there that, that doing exactly that. So yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting time now because obviously we, we need to look at this, uh, this lawyer, this Bobby Sternheim. I found her extremely and a very interesting character. I mean, why she slain Maxwell would choose her apart from the fact she's the, uh, I think she was the former head of the uh, New York uh, Women Bar Association. So she's at the highest level in, she had the peak of a career, you know, the next move will be, will be to go uh, to go feds and to, to become a judge. But uh, I believe the money is pretty good out there when you represent people like uh, Khaled Al-Fawad, you know, people that have bombed two American embassy in Africa. And uh, also she's, uh, you know, she's been working alongside uh, quite a few mobsters as well. And uh, I'm sure some researchers can tell more about that. But uh, she's, uh, she's an interesting character. She's extremely well connected, well respected as well. And uh, she's going to fire everything she has, you know, and she knows how it works, you know. So it's, it's interesting to see that the judge is not biting into that. And I understand why it's not, but she's not biting into that. That's, that makes sense to me. All right. Well, I'm glad you brought up the lawyer because the next thing I'm going to read is a letter that was submitted by the law offices of Bobby Sternheim that was written on November 24th. And yeah. get your thoughts on this thread because this pertains to what has just happened. Dear yeah. Judge Nathan, as counsel for Ghislaine Maxwell, I write in response to the government's letter dated November 23rd, reporting Miss Maxwell's conditions of detention and confirming that she is currently in quarantine due to contact with a staff member assigned to her isolation pod who tested positive for COVID-19. The government recites a variety of allowances given Miss Maxwell including being permitted out of her cell three times a week during quarantine for a maximum of 30 minutes. The total time allotted for showering, making personal calls, and using the core links email system to communicate with family and counsel. However, the letter presents an incomplete picture of Miss Maxwell's conditions of confinement. The government fails to mention a variety of issues brought to the attention of the MDC, including but not limited to the fact that all email correspondence between Ms. Maxwell and counsel was deleted in advance of the 180 day period when deletion is expected to occur, semicolon. That after being administered two nasal swab tests under threat of 21 day quarantine, if she declined to be tested, Miss Maxwell was ordered to remove her COVID protection mask for an in-mouth inspection, further risking exposure to the virus, semicolon. That Miss Maxwell was initially quarantined without soap or a toothbrush, semicolon. That medical and psychology staff who checked on Miss Maxwell daily pre-quarantine have ceased doing so daily since quarantine 
and I've neither informed her of results of the COVID test nor provided information in response to her inquiry regarding what she should do if she becomes symptomatic. Look like you have something to say, Fred, before I continue. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's really, this is just like, this is a game, literally. I mean, we can't take this seriously, really. I mean, she's, <laughs> there's no reason for the, the government to explain themselves why she has been put in on isolation. I mean, we're in a prison. I mean, you know very well the prison environment. If you're a child molester, plus you're extremely wealthy, you're double target, simple as that. You know, she cannot be mixed with a gen pop. Absolutely a no-go. Now, I like the terms they use about this uh, isolation pod you know i mean that's uh, that's a bit uh, <laughs> i mean i don't know where they found that one but i find it interesting the second part of it is uh they will just basically pick on every single details one guy is going to be tested positive there you go the life of she slave maxwell has been endangered and then uh, they will mention something actually quite interesting from a legal point of view the 180 days the 180 days where the emails between the council and the defendants are being cancelled so they're going to pick on that saying she needs more time buying more time buying more time and that's exactly what they've been doing from day one all the rest about toothbrush and all this nonsense i mean you in jail you in jail because you are extremely dangerous to society and the government has basically brought charges against you because there is 118 gender out there looking to, for compensation and reparation because your attitude because the way you have been uh, uh, working together with Jeffrey Epstein has represented dangers to society so from the moment you're danger to society you lose all your rights so it doesn't matter which lawyer uh, is going to go uh, into this case all they're going to do is basically nag about little things and that's what the I'm really happy with the judge they're just not biting with this they're not giving it any traction and they're absolutely right because from a legal point of view at the end of the day the BOP are in the rights uh, I've seen also that uh, Gisled Maxwell and Bobby uh, Sternheim has asked uh, one of the uh, BOP guys to be interviewed by the government to provide, you know, inside information as far as the treatment concerned, because they're all saying that she's been unfairly uh, treated uh, behind bars. But that's not the case. You know, they're trying to protect her because... There are dangers, you know, out there. And when the lawyers, just to finish, uh, Sean, is that when she mentioned that you could compare uh, conditions uh, behind the bars as Florence Ad Max or the 10 South, you know these terms, you know what it is. <laughs> these are where terrorist people that are just, you know, absolutely dangerous to the world <laughs> are incarcerated. And I can tell you, she's not even near to that. So... All I can say to you, Sean, is that she could have done 10 pages. It would have been the same nonsense. It just doesn't stick. We're in the legal framework, and that has no bite. And if Maxwell's trying to play the poor conditions card, how come she has access to a computer? She's got a whole floor to herself. She's got an extraordinary amount of uh, phone calls and visits over and above the other prisoners. If anything... She's got all of these extra liberties that nobody else has. So anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to read this. Um, let's see. The letter amidst the fact that while staff are not supposed to enter Miss Maxwell's isolation cell during quarantine, an unidentified man entered to take photographs and a guard entered to search. So if, you, if you're in... If you're in high security that was me. levels, that was me, Sean. That was me. I confess. <laughs> if you're in high security levels, the guards come in your cell all the time. They do a head count at least every thirty minutes or an hour. They they walk the run. They look in the cell, and if they think you are an escape risk, they could come in your cell any time. Tap the plexiglass windows. Check the light fixtures. Have a little mooch around to see if you're trying to make anything like a shank or a cutting tool to get through the glass with or to get through your door with. To say that someone came in a cell while she's in prison, a guard entered a cell to do a cell search, and that is a problem. 
Where does, she think, search unit. where does she think she is? She thinks... No. <laughs> no. Sorry. Sorry, no. It just doesn't fly, you know. I mean, it's obviously someone that has, was raised with a silver spoon in her in a mouth and suddenly she's in a, you know, is in a, in a prison environment where she she's losing control. So when you've been used all your life to control every single move and basically talk down on people and, you know, giving orders, and then suddenly you just someone out there that follow orders that doesn't control anything at all so it's probably what's really the the process of you know become an inmate and understanding that you are an inmate awaiting for trial and it's nothing pleasant about it and uh, i think this is you know the remainers thinking that the money this is where the arrogance is with Shislaine maxwell she thinks that with the money that she was throwing at the church with the money that she's paying bobby sternheim you know, I don't know how much she getting paid for that, but she thinks that that's going to be enough to, you know, to turn the tables upside down and then, you know, she'd be able to walk out and uh, do whatever she wants. She's just thinking she's smarter than everybody. And unfortunately, now we can see that it's, going to, it's, it's starting to transpire. All this nonsense is transpiring and it looks to me like it's a bit of a desperate attempt. You know, this is going to trial. There might be a fix, but not the things like we, we're looking at. I think I've got a little idea, but uh, I'm working on it. And I like to pick the brains of a few researchers who've got the, the potential fix because this cannot go to trial as we all know it. So what's going to happen? That's going to be very interesting. So Epstein survivor Kirby Summers back in the chat. And she has said that Ghislaine was receiving one of her favorite snacks. She has lots of perks, a private bathroom, a private TV, and more. A private bathroom? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I mean, one of the horrors of being in prison is having to share a bathroom, shower, toilet facility with 200 other people. And it, you can imagine, um, I've been in every single security level through my ecstasy trafficking case back now in the um, 1990s that happened. And um, I was incarcerated in, in the uh, 2002 around then. So almost six years for every security level. And when you go in these shower facilities, it's like a cubicle where dozens of big, muscular, tattooed, sweaty, hairy men have been in there and there's like a puddle of, let's just say, male fluids on the floor swirling around with pubic hair and flies and cockroaches and assorted insects. And if, there's a sh if you're lucky enough to have a shower porter working that day, the whole thing will have been bleached out and reeking of bleach to get rid of the mildew. So, and I, re I remember in Supermax, the water only runs for 10 minutes for security purposes. You press this button and they leave you in there. You know, they, they own handcuff you through the door and leave you in there for hours on end. And in the beginning, I was yelling, let me out, let me out, let me out. And they absolutely would not let me out. <laughs> they, they prided themselves on trapping you in there in such horrible conditions and the power that they had over you. But Maxwell's got her own bathroom. <laughs> oh my I mean, goodness! We, we, we. I mean, this is I, when you find out all these details, and Kirby is great at finding out all, all these things. And she, it just, I was reading it uh, not so long ago. I think she posted it, and I was like, "What? I mean, I, where are we? Here? You know." And plus, she's asking for more. You know, and it's always complaining about her conditions. I don't think she really understands what the conditions of a normal inmate is. She's far away. I mean, the only reason why she's far away from it is because of Epstein's, you know, the mistake they made with Epstein's, you know, they're allowed to happen anyway. So they can't afford any, any, any mistake with Shislaine Maxwell. And that currently give her a pretty decent life behind bars awaiting the trial you know so uh, what i like about Ghislaine maxwell you know she used to go under the surname of g max 
because that's the name she used to, you know, when she used to purchase stuff or do whatever, she was always presented as G Max. And now she's gonna, you know, she's complaining that she is into incarceration conditions as a super max, you know. So I found that hilarious. I was like, you didn't, I bet when you were using this name, you didn't feel that one day you will be behind bars, you know. So <laughs> she's where she belongs, Sean. And I think we're gonna uh, see more stunts. So we need to get ready for more stunts from Bobby. She has many, many tricks in her hat. And this is only the first rabbit. We're gonna see many more, that's for sure. All right, let me just continue then to finish this letter. So let's see, where were we? Oh, we had the unidentified um, man enter and the guard entered. Um, further, while council assumed that an in-person legal visit scheduled for Saturday, November 21st would be canceled as a result of Miss Maxwell's quarantine status, no notification was provided and a request for a substituted legal call was not accommodated. So if you have a legal visit scheduled and scheduling visits when you're incarcerated is a nightmare. Someone doesn't just show up and say, hey, I wanna see Joe Bloggs, bring him out here. No, 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 no. You have to have people visiting you pre-screened. They have to apply to come in to visit you. They have to be background checked Money has to be paid to for the jail to process all of this. And it could take weeks, if not months, to get someone on someone's approved visitor list. So say someone, one of my followers, and this has happened, wanted to fly out to Arizona to visit, you know, mm -hmm. one of the prisoners I support out there, such as T-Bone. Um, that person's family had to go through so much rigmarole. By the time that they we're going to get approved for it. The visit to Arizona was already going to be over. So that's how hard it is to get in to visit someone. But for our lawyers, the process is fast-tracked. So the lawyers are regularly coming in and out. So they don't have to be on the visitation list for each individual prisoner. It's a separate category of legal visits. But the legal visits still have to go through a scheduling process. Now, if you cancel anything in prison... They don't just say, okay, we'll fix this. Just, you can have your visit tomorrow or the, or the day after that. It's just, it just does not work as easily as that. The layers yeah. of bureaucracy go into motion and it, you know, it could take uh, weeks to reschedule things. Things get lost in the paperwork shuffle and um, you don't just click your fingers because something's been canceled because of Corona and think it's gonna be delivered to you the next day. That's absolutely ludicrous. All right, so here's what, here's what the lawyer is saying. No notification was provided. A request for a substitute legal call was not accommodated. Because all of these jails are short staffed right now because of the corona, things are not operating as they're supposed to. And at the very best of times, things move at a snail's pace. I did an uh, interview on the BBC about the philosophy of patience and waiting. And it was all taught to me because nothing happens fast in that environment. And when you get out, you realize because the world is moving at this fast pace. So it's a, it's a completely different world. So this moaning is just um, ridiculous. All right, the government highlights what Miss Maxwell has permitted, but not what she is denied. Equal treatment accorded of inmates in general population. Miss Maxwell has spent the entirety of her pretrial detention in de facto solitary confinement under the most restrictive conditions where she is excessively and invasively searched and is monitored 24 hours per day. Well, guess what? That's because your co-defendant was suicided in a jail right around the corner from you. And you are the most <laughs> watched, highest profile prisoner in the world right now. This is the biggest true crime story in the world right now. I have never even heard of a prisoner having an entire floor in, in a jailhouse building <laughs> i would make the most of it <laughs> get out there do some pull-ups and push-ups and okay um in addition to camera surveillance in her cell a supplemental camera follows her movement when she is permitted to leave her isolation cell and is focused on miss maxwell and cancel during in personal legal visits all right so if this camera is focused on her in a legal visit I'm imagining that it cannot record the conversation. 
because legal conversations are privileged information. So Correct. perhaps that is just a visual camera that is in there to prevent anything being passed back and forth or any, any you know, uh, unusual activity from occurring because this is a case that attracts unusual activity. And despite nonstop in-cell camera surveillance, Miss Maxwell's sleep is disrupted every 15 minutes when she's awakened by a flashlight to ascertain whether she is breathing. Miss Maxwell is a non-violent exemplary pretrial detainee with no criminal history, no history of violence, no history of mental health issues or suicidal ideation, but years of history of super predation. I added that. She is overmanaged under conditions more restrictive than inmates housed in 10 South. The most restrictive unit in the MCC all individuals convicted of terrorism and capital murder and incarcerated in FCI Florence AD Max, the most restrictive facility operated by the BOP. And Sammy de Bulgravano was actually housed in FCI Florence AD Max. And Sammy de Bulgravano has started his own YouTube channel, and I'm absolutely gripped by his stories. He's such a brilliant storyteller, and it's fascinating, not just his prison stories, but stories from his mafia life. So, um, giving, the conditions giving, there are. Give, Giving him, giving him a, a recommendation. The conditions are absolutely horrendous. Yeah, um, he said he said he had to take a crap in front of a female guard, watching him take a crap and wipe his ass. He asked her to turn around, and she and she said she was instructed that she could absolutely not let him out of her sight, and she had to watch him taking a crap. Yeah. yeah. All right. So the MDC concedes that it is unable to place her in general population for her safety and the security of the institution, but fails to explain why she is deprived of all other opportunities provided to general pop inmates. Stating that Miss Maxwell continues to have more time to review her discovery than any other inmate at the MDC, even while in quarantine, gives the unfair impression that she is being given a perquisite. However, given the voluminous discovery in this case, the most recent production alone being 1.2 million documents. Oh, ho, ho. she's going to spend the rest of her life going through a discovery? Yeah. 1.2 million documents. Did you know that, Fred? Yeah, no, yeah, 1.2. They've announced it actually at the last hearing you were listening to. They were actually explaining that uh, the first release was around 250,000 documents and the second batch was 1.2 million. So, I mean, we're talking about her. No way she can go through all of that. But uh, again, that's what you get a legal, uh, legal counsel. Yeah, they, they help you to navigate these kind of documents. And uh, I think at least it keeps her busy. You know, the worst thing that can happen to you in jail is the, is, is probably the, you know, the, the spending a time just waiting, you know, just no, nothing to do, you know. So she has a case to prepare. She's been giving plenty of time. She's been given access to computers, to showers, to whatever you want. She's in a very good condition to prepare herself for the trial. So 1.2 million, it's a lot of documents. I, 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 do, I do agree with that. But uh, yet again, you know, that's just to provide an ID to the, you know, to, to the defense, how much they have on her, how much investigation has been conducted and how much the defense needs to prepare themselves because what they're coming with, they're coming with, they're coming with, with some really serious stuff, you know, that's why she's behind the bars. Um, before I continue with the letter, then I just want to add that I've not introduced Fred properly. We were so excited today. We just got off to this this fast start because of this Maxwell news. Fred has been at the forefront of investigating Jean-Luc Brunel in France. He's part of a group of activists who have been working together to keep track of him, keep him in the news, and get Jean-Luc Brunel brought to justice. So we did a live stream. I don't know, it must have been about a couple of weeks ago. And it went viral, actually, because that was right on the back of Jean-Luc Brunel getting arrested. Now, if you're not familiar with Fred's work, then I have just added all of the links in the description box below this video. Fred has his own YouTube channel, mostly in French. I know um, a lot of you like, like it when he, he, does his, uh, he does his French talk. 
and um, pops his champagne on, on these celebratory occasions. We have Fred's Twitter. He's got quite a following growing on his YouTube channel and Twitter right now, thanks to a lot of the people who found him through this channel. So please go down and support Fred on his links. On this channel now, we also have over 400 videos on the Epstein case. And we have a whole playlist link. That's the JLB videos, which is in the description box. Of all of the work we have done with Fred over the months, going over Jean-Luc Brunel's entire life history and his crimes. And some of the things that we talked about in the last live stream have come to fruition because the authorities in France are now requesting the cooperation of Prince Andrew. But we're gonna to get to that once we finish with this stuff here. So, all right, I'll get, get back to the letter. Um, anything you'd like to add to that, Fred, about people finding you and, and messaging you? Now, what I would like to say, first of all, thank you so much for all the support. It's just been absolutely amazing. And I'm getting so much questions, so much information, so much support out there. I've done stack stuff with you for the last past three months, and it's just been helping me growing uh, my channel to get the word out. Probably what I would like to add is that in 2021, we're going to have much more videos in English. So... I know the translation is good and I know the sub is nice, but at the end of the day, there's nothing like a good chat in English. So I'm going to make the effort to have both of my videos, uh, you know, one in French and one in English. Uh, my English is not perfect, but at least I can get a message across. And the whole idea, as I said, is to have someone in France that can actually give you their, you know, the, the uh, updates on the, this uh, French segment of the uh, Epstein saga. So a lot of things coming up. There's a lot of hope from this French investigation to get involved and to push, obviously, as you said, uh, Prince Andrew, or just let's call him Andrew uh, for, for the sake of it. But he's, uh, he, needs to, he needs to talk and uh, uh, we have a lot of hope. And what I'm hearing inside is that uh, they really don't take any prisoner. You know, if these guys needs to talk, they're going to ask him to talk. And then let's see how is he going to react. You know, let's see if he's going to do the same as he did with the FBI. You know, he's going to say that he wants to cooperate, but he never does anything in that direction, in that sense. So let's wait. Let's see. But uh, thank you again. I'll take this opportunity to thanks everyone that came from your channel uh, and to my channel and really, really show some real uh, love, and, love and support. And, and I'm grateful for that. It's great. We've got this network of people now ranging from the survivors in America, um, Charlie Robinson, Ryan Dawson, you, Fred. I mean, we're just absolutely all over the world, but really, yeah. you know, reaching a lot of people with this information. So uh, the fact that we're connected just multiplies the effect of what we're all doing because we share this information, we share our platforms and it all dovetails really nicely. So going back to this letter, uh, 1.2 million documents. <laughs> mm -hmm. I read I read Tolstoy's War and Peace. That was what, 1,444 pages. It took me quite a long time. 1.2 million documents. Wow. Um, that is why Maxwell has a computer because prisoners usually they get like the grand jury indictment in paper form and they get all their legal discovery in paper form through a legal visit in the prison. But if you have 1.2 million documents, that would fill an entire floor of the jail as well. So that is why her lawyer would have requested that she has access to a computer so she can go over all these documents on the computer and find things that will help better prepare her defense. So they're looking for chinks in the prosecutor's um, information, which is called legal discovery. In the, in the run-up to the supposed trial, Maxwell is entitled to get all of the legal discovery, all the stuff that the prosecutor has. So she can come up with counterclaims and prefer her defense. So her legal team now will be pouring all over that. And we've done multiple videos about what a plea bargain is. I've got just an entire YouTube video on what is a plea bargain, if you want to check that out. This case, I am 99% betting will end up in a plea bargain, whereby once all of the information has been absorbed, once all of these court dates, the judges ruled this way or that way, then once all that's out the way, she will take stock of her plea bargaining power at that junction right before trial, and she will sign for so many years to avoid 
going to trial and getting a super aggravated sentence whereby she could never ever get out of prison for the rest of her life. She'll, by that time, she'll be thinking, all right, maybe five to 10 year plea bargain range is um, actually, I'm gonna do quite well with that rather than spending the rest of my life in prison. A plea bargain does not mean you pick your own sentence. It means you agree to a prospective sentencing range. So if they say to her, if we find you guilty on all these charges, we'll run them all at the same time. We won't stack them. And the highest you'll get will, will be 10 years and the lowest you'll get will be five. And then she'll get up on the stand, cry her eyes out, give all of her mitigating circumstances and hope that the judge rules and sentences her at the lower end of that range. That's how I believe it will play out because the, the, because the big names like Wexner and Conrad, uh, um, Black and Clinton, um, they, they will stop those from ever being released. Any, anything you want to add onto that, Fred? Yes, uh, w what I would say probably is that uh, Ghislaine Maxwell is at a crossroad as far as her connection with the intelligence, uh, uh, the intelligence community at large. And so we've seen it on many occasions when a, such a high value target, a, such a high value commodity, because she processes a lot of information, uh, it's easy to believe that she has recorded a lot of the conversations, a lot of what's going on on the islands and other properties. I mean, she spends so much time with Jeffrey Epstein, although, you know, this is something that uh, it goes back quite a bit of time. Uh, any intelligent person, any person that is involved with intelligence will learn the ABC and first is to cover you back and making sure that uh, if you get caught, you're gonna have something to bargain with. Now she's not, doesn't have much to bargain with. She has a bit of money, but more importantly, she has information. The problem with information is that uh, if she's gonna get a fix and she's going to get out the intelligence community at least those that are pretty much protecting the information that he that she has will know that she spoke and therefore she will become a natural target so it's not an easy there's not a win-win situation she's going to have to sacrifice something one's going to be if she gets a get out and she starts to talk she's going to be watching her back for the rest of her life. Number two, if she cooperates and she's turned as an asset, then at that moment in time, I would say that I might disagree with you in the sense that they might go after a much bigger cat. But that, again, we are looking into a political case, something that is you know, at the forefront of the political agenda. So we need to see who is in the White House at this moment in time. And so far, we all have we have you, you only have a, an, an elect u.s president so that's all you have at the moment so we need to wait how this is going to evolve in january see if donald trump uh, might have something strong enough to uh, to change the uh, uh you know to 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 change the uh, the uh, the current situations but as far as i'm concerned it's going to be political it's going to be a political decisions if she talks she needs to be protected if she doesn't talk she's going to do some time and in the pri previous uh, video that we did with Fred, we discussed the changing political winds, the Biden-Clinton crime family connection, and how the honey trap information, if Maxwell has that stored, it is the biggest treasure trove of political capital in the world right now. And the intelligence agencies, no doubt, multiple intelligence agencies, have either got that or they're trying to get that uh, so that they can use it to their advantage in this battle of the various political mafia. All right, going back. She's a big fish. She's, she's, a big, she's a big fish in the tank. There's no doubt about it. You know, I, as I said from day one, I always said, you know, you got to follow the money. And the money comes from the Bob Maxwell. It comes from Ghislaine Maxwell and the connections that goes with it. They were offered a lot of money and a big structure to lend the money because that was already in place during the time of Bob Maxwell, but in the UK. So some of the money that was already um, taken out of the pension fund from the daily mineral pensioners and those you know that that money is not just vanished in the air they've recouped some of that money but some of it obviously uh, disappeared we know that Ghislaine Maxwell has a trust fund it's about a hundred grand a year so it's not a lot of money for a trust kid you know it's, it's it's peanuts basically but as far as we know she's was she inherited of a structure to lend the money and that's what make her a boss in her own right 
Tasminda, she's playing, and I was reading some of the documents, you know, earlier documents about a statement stating how much she actually really had on her account, saying that she has $1.5 million, some properties in France, uh, uh, bonds, I think 3.5 mi millions of bonds, but she's a much bigger fish than that. She has put a lot of money aside. She's landed a lot of money, some, some very toxic assets for many, many, many people uh, along the years. And that's what Jepstein was doing with her along you know, beside the fact they were abusing, you know, minors. But uh, this is a big, big, big operation. It's far bigger than just sex abuse or sex trafficking. We're talking about a, a much bigger case there. And uh, we're going to see how it's going to evolve. Uh, and I hope we're going to see some new names appearing as of January. Yeah, and this money, this network that she inherited from her dad... I mean, if you've read a book like The Assassination of Robert Maxwell, The Tentacles, never in my life of studying criminals have I come across anything so extensive. I mean, Robert Maxwell, he had access to leaders all over the world, heads of the cartels all over the world. He was laundering money for from Russian mafia to Yakuza in Japan to the South and Central Americans. And then his work for all of the various intelligence agencies. He would come back from Russia, give information to MI5, MI6, go over to Israel, give them information, trade up with the CIA. He'd be, you know, he was in, in the Iran Contra mix, selling the Promise software, uh, which gave, had a backdoor to reveal, you know, all of the secrets including nuclear secrets. So yep. the, the, the shenanigans that Robert Maxwell got up to, it really should be put in a movie because there's never, ever it been any, anyone quite like him. It, it deserved, it deserved a, a, a definitely a motion picture. And I think that really a passage that would be extremely interesting is when the CIA and Israel is asking Bob Maxwell, you know, companies, basically the corporate infrastructures, what I call Maxwell Inc., to be able basically to incubate all this money and to keep that money until the deal is done. So he's got money, half of the money from Israel, half of the money from the CIA, and this is going through his account. Now, people are asking how Maxwell made his money. Well, I can tell you, he got a big chunk out of that. He definitely, basically raised more money that's why he was in so much debt because he had a huge collateral that just didn't belong to him but nobody could ask any questions nobody wanted to ask any questions so they were just giving him money throwing money at him because he had huge collateral but then when israel when cia is starting to pull out what happened is that suddenly he doesn't have the collateral. So he was a small internal Ponzi skin, if you will. You know, he needed that money to be able to pay and ask for more money. And what happened is that money just disappeared. CIA probably decided to move that money somewhere else. And that's exactly what happened. Now, we don't need you, Bob Maxwell. What are you going to do? And he went down and he wanted to talk. That's probably what he got out. That's what he got to him. So in the live chat... Epstein survivor Kirby Summers has commented, Ghislaine Maxwell was broke when she arrived in New York. She had to live in a $500 a month apartment. I'd like to get your thoughts on that, Fred, because my understanding is that Robert Maxwell set his kids up for life with these trust funds that were untouchable with money that he had pilfered from some of it from the people who worked for him from the pension fund. And I don't believe that Maxwell has ever been broke. I think this perhaps is part of Maxwell's myth that she's put out there. What, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. It's basically, I mean, at the time, obviously, you know, it's not because the, the brothers, you know, uh, uh, brothers basically were incriminated, but eventually they were, you know, they were just let off, you know, because they were tracing the money, but the money was long, long time gone. So when Gislaine left and she was, you know, daddy's girl, she was the closest to Bob Maxwell. So 
it was not over for her. They, they were watching her. They were watching what she was doing. And she just literally did what any intelligent person will do. She kept a low profile and starting to disseminate this myth that she was broke. But uh, we know better than that. The trust funds was already in place. We know she's getting 100 grand a year. And more importantly, if you were to ask our dear friend Darren in Dyke, you know, that signed the contract to get her a property in Manhattan, you'll tell you that she was far from being broke. So again, this is a myth, disinformation, just to, to get the justice, you know, on the wrong path. Uh, but she's never, she was never broke. So all of a sudden, her husband was posting the majority of this $30 million bond package. Like, where did this money come from? And then researching <laughs> further, it was her money to begin with in the first place. So it's, it's, it's just financial musical chairs with her. Look, it's uh, again, you know, that it's open to speculations. You know, if you do the research on that, you're, you're going to really going to have to dig deep because that money is, is gone dark. You know, so I believe personally that uh, Ghislaine has learned something from, uh, you know, mingling around with intelligence people is that you need to put and you always need to have passports and money somewhere, not under your name. All you have is a code, a key. And that's pretty much what she, she's done and she learned it well. She placed her money. And I think that uh, if the investigation carries on, we're gonna find out that Ghislaine Maxwell has not only more money with Bogerson, but she has more money with other people as well in other places in the world. So there's no way this money is Bogerson's gonna spend $21 million on her. It's just the uh, ease of basically the 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 guarantor if you will you know of her money and because the trust the relationship is in place she felt comfortable in putting that money there knowing that whatever happened she would always have a, a you know a honey pot there she can you know she can go back to uh, whatever happened if it gets tough you know just to finish this letter then so they're saying that miss maxwell remains inadequate for her to review and prepare the defense of her life Due to the failure of MDC's warden and legal department to responding to recurring problems and complaints, council have reached out to the government. While we appreciate any assistance provided by government council, it has done little to redress the many concerns regarding the disparate treatment of Miss Maxwell. Rather than receive secondhand information from council, the defense requests that the court summon warden Heriberto Tellez to report directly to the court and counsel on Miss Maxwell's conditions of detention. Your consideration is greatly appreciated. So that was the letter saying that she's being treated unfairly and we don't believe any of it. No, we can't, we, we, we just can't. So we're gonna move over to the big document now and uh, <laughs> it's 45 pages. <laughs> so I was, this, <laughs> I was skipping through. I was skipping through, and I just quickly, and I just say, just preparing myself a little bit. I'm just gonna, I just have to laugh, you know. But there's some very interesting, I mean, uh, there's some very good information in that document for sure. So, this, uh, these are the reasons that Maxwell's team have put forward as to why she should be released on bail because things have changed so much in her favor since the previous denial. And what I'll do is I'm gonna read a little bit of this at a time, get, get discuss it with Fred and then, then go on to the next bit. So let's start with page seven, preliminary statement. Ghislaine Maxwell respectfully submits this memorandum in support of a renewed motion for release on bail. She's proposing an expansive set of bail conditions that is more than adequate to address any concern regarding risk of flight and reasonably assure Miss Maxwell's presence in court. Miss Maxwell also provides compelling additional information in this submission, not available at the time of the initial bail hearing, which was held 12 days after her arrest, that squarely addresses each of the court's concerns from the initial hearing and fully supports her release on the proposed bail conditions. This information includes evidence of Maxwell's significant family ties in the United States. A detailed financial report, oh, I can't wait to see that, which has also been reviewed 
by a former IRS CID special agent concerning her financial condition and assets and those of her spouse for the last five years. Three irrevocable waivers of a right to contest extradition from the UK and France and expert opinions stating that it would be highly unlikely that Miss Maxwell would be able to resist extradition in the implausible event of her fleeing to either country. Four, evidence rebutting the government's contention that Miss Maxwell attempted to evade detection by law enforcement prior to her arrest. And five, a discussion of the weakness of the government's case. The weakness of the government's case. <laughs> <laughs> you like that one? <laughs> you would. Dream world. Dream world. Against yeah. Miss Maxwell, including the lack of corroborative, contemporaneous documentary evidence in support of the three accusers. Anything you'd like to add to paragraph? That paragraph, um, Fred. <laughs> I think it said it all. I mean, it's it's in, almost embarrassing. It's, it's, it's embarrassing because it, it just doesn't have any ground, you know, or it's just a... It's, it's, it's a tiptoeing, it's a dance, you know, it's, that's, that's all it is. And uh, I've seen it so many times. It doesn't even impress me anymore. And I'm sure the judge probably put it aside with their coffee and just look at it away and say, <laughs> ignoring it, literally. All right, next paragraph. Maxwell vehemently maintains her innocence and is committed to defending herself. She wants nothing more than to remain in this country to fight the allegations against her, which are based on un corroborated testimony of a handful of witnesses about events that took place over 25 years ago. The court should grant Miss Maxwell bail on the restrictive conditions proposed below to ensure her constitutional rights to prepare her defense. All right, before I go to the next paragraph then, so they're trying to like, they're saying because it's over 25 years ago, as if time has, means that it's it's somehow turned this case stale. What do you think about that, Fred? Does 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 a kid getting trafficked and abused, does time ease all that? Doesn't make any difference. You know, from the moment you've gone through that in your life, uh, you will never be the same person. So you cannot attach time with money, with compensation, with uh, well-being or not well-being. This is something that only a victim can uh, can can talk about. I've never been victim of uh, of that, so I'll, I I will never speak on behalf of of these people because everybody has their own way to deal with that, and uh, it's so personal. Uh, some people do reconstruct their life, and uh, but at what price? And uh, some people will. Uh, lose themselves and uh, find themselves you know in uh, in in big trouble some will go to drugs alcohol addictions just trying to you know to to live with it because you're living with something that you're ashamed of and uh, that's one part of it and then uh, there's many other aspects of it but uh, it will be a long debate but uh, my opinion of it is that this is really each victim as their own way to look into that uh, deal with it and more importantly not being able to to strengthen uh, um, herself or his self, you know, for, 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 for fighting, you know, for fighting back, you know, and I think uh, that's what I'm admiring the most in, in everything we're doing, Sean, is that uh, we men, you know, we're strong, we, you know, we, we have the chance to be able out there and fight for, for whatever we want, but some women that are very vulnerable when they're young, they just don't have that strength, they don't have that will, they don't have no home to go back to, you know, and so uh, when you don't have that, when you have nowhere to go back, that's mean you're in a corner, then clearly, you know, this is where you are already almost a victim because you're putting yourself in the situations and these predators like Epstein, like Brunel, like she said, Maxwell, this is what they preyed upon, your vulnerability. And they will try to be the father or the mother that you have lost or that was not there for you when they, suppose, they were supposed to be there, you know? So this is really sick and these are psychopaths and they are worse than criminal. I prefer a bank robber, I have more respect for a bank robber than these people. And that's how bad it is. So Maxwell, it seems, is trying to play time in two ways. There's multiple clocks ticking here. I'm just gonna get your perspective on this thread. So clock number one is the statute of limitations clock. 
And if you're not familiar with that, we, we have gone over it a few times, but if you commit a crime, they only have a certain amount of years to get you and convict you. And if the statute of limitations clock has elapsed, then they can no longer prosecute you for those crimes. But we're seeing many states and federal jurisdiction expanding the statute of limitations on crimes of this nature, which yeah. is a good thing. Now, the other clock that Maxwell's got ticking, I believe, is the clock of survivors taking compensation money from Epstein's estate and in doing so, agreeing that they can thereby not become witnesses in the case against Maxwell. So that is a clock that's running right now that she's banking on getting these witnesses out of her way because the whole of her sentence revolves around her plea bargaining power. If she has three witnesses against her versus 30 witnesses, because what we just read in the legal paperwork, they said it's only three witnesses uncorroborated 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. Clock, clock, clock. If it's only three versus 30, then her plea bargaining power is greatly enhanced on that factor alone. Of the other factors that will work against them. So, Fred, um, probably not. We probably don't want to rehash all of the statute of limitations stuff again. But the second clock, then. Uh, survive sorry, the just to stop you for one second. I mean, yeah. with regards to Gislaine Maxwell, I mean, you probably covered it well. What I'd like, I'll take the opportunity to add up something that I found out that in, in human trafficking, when you talk about human trafficking, for example, in France, you're outside of the statute of limitation so that you're not even in the same legal framework. There's no statute of limitation when you talk about human trafficking. This is why it's so important that the government can stick upon Maxwell, Brunel, whoever is going to be indicted for human trafficking, the, the status of limitation is never going to apply. And that's what's very interesting from a legal point of view, because if you can stick that and it, you know, and you have evidence of human trafficking, it doesn't matter how long, if it was 30, 40, 60 years ago, if they get you and they have the evidence to get you for human trafficking, you're going down. Is that the same in France? Absolutely. Uh, the statute of limitation in France was not only so long ago, 2006, 2016, uh, yes, 16, sorry, 2016 was 10 years, and then they put it up to 20 years. So that's for crimes, misdemeanors, it's only six or eight years. And then uh, for human trafficking, trafficking, they've never changed it. If you are caught, you have evidence and charge against you for human trafficking, you're going down. It doesn't matter when it occurs. You know this is why it's very difficult to bring these charges to anybody in France because you need to have a very very strong case. And we saw that with uh, Jean-Luc Brunel, for instance. Uh, they downscale the uh, human trafficking charges because the judge felt that he was not strong enough. That was not strong enough evidence. There were evidence of, of, of uh, human trafficking, but not strong enough to be able to guarantee a conviction. So they downscale it. They're going to put an assisted witness, for instance, you know, uh, a status that's going to allow them to go back to revisit the charges. And then when the evidence piled up enough, then they bring it back again. But that's what they're aiming for. So we know these are extremely strong cases. These are not like cases. These are extremely strong, uh, very strong cases. And we've seen our governments in France, in the U.S., they are going for it. And uh, they will not get into this boat unless they have enough evidence in their hands. So limitation is, uh, I don't think it's going to play in the favor of Ghislaine Maxwell in that sense. But the other side, which you just mentioned, will. You know, All right, the, the, the second people. clock, the second clock then, Fred, are you able just to bring people up to speed on the money that is available to the Epstein survivors? What is actually in the process of being claimed right now by people? And how many potential witnesses against Maxwell that has managed to remove so far and potentially how many more it could remove in the future. Yeah, this is a lot of information, uh, Sean. I, I've got it on paper, but I will not, I will have to go through that. I don't want to give numbers today. So I'm going to, I'm going to take a joker on that one, <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you will. But uh, this is a, a lot of information. I mean, you, you have a huge amount of, uh, 
uh, of a uh, uh, of girls that have gone through the uh, the the compensation scheme, you know, with the uh, the estate. So uh, some of them have already got paid. I know that for sure. But uh, how many hasn't been paid? How much has been already disbursed, and so on? It's it's a bit of a calculation. Uh, so no, I, I'll pass on that one because it's got, we have to be precise, and I can't be at this moment in time. All right, let me just have a quick Google of that then to see if I can get any of the latest um, numbers. Yeah. Hold on a second. Let's see in the past week. Uh, oh, it says Maxwell seeks legal fees from alleged Epstein victim. Maxwell objects to potential witnesses. Um, off accepting offers from the Epstein victims compensation program. So basically they're, they're offering this money to try and just get these people out of the way. And um, let me see if I can get any more information here. Epstein's, uh, it's got an article right here. So this, the date of this article is 20, 23rd of December. And it says for the second time this month, an alleged abuse survivor is running into unexpected opposition from Maxwell as the alleged victim tries to dismiss a civil lawsuit against Maxwell and the estate of Epstein. The victim yeah. may, may be a key prosecution witness at the criminal trial of Maxwell. And a, here's a quote from Robert Glassman, a lawyer for the anonymous plaintiff. Miss Maxwell is clearly trying to gain an unfair advantage over all these victims. I've never had a case in my career where a defendant is blocking the plaintiff's attempt to dismiss the plaintiff's case. Mm. So the Survivor 40 accepted an offer earliest month from the Epstein Victims Compensation Program, an independently operated restitution fund established by the co-executors of Epstein's estate. Is, is Indyke involved in this? Absolutely, yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. Uh, it's Indyke, Darren Indyke and Richard Ken. Yeah, these are the... Uh, and then there's three other people involved as well. Uh, uh, it's kind of a committee, a committee that's going to basically manage the funds, you know, and manage obviously the interaction with um, with the victims. These are people that have huge experience in compensating uh, uh, victims of, of, of crimes and violent crimes. So I remember the three of them, I have their names somewhere, but are, these are very, very the people that have been chosen by uh, uh, by the estates to uh, to represent the interests of the victims. So there's a kind of a fair play in, in in the process. But as you said, we all know what this estate, what this compensation fund is all about, is is to get basically this victim out of the way and then to basically take away from them the right to pursue further to to go with legal actions against them. So that's the only reason why it's there for. So this is a legal strategy now that's not in any of the court paperwork that we've been discussing today, but behind the scenes, she's they're trying to buy off the survivors to increase Maxwell's plea bargaining power. Just to, just to continue with this article, to finalize the deal, she is required to dismiss all pending litigation against the estate and any former employee of Epstein and his thicket of companies. Yeah. The estate would not settle the case without Maxwell being part of it. That is a quote, a direct quote from Glass, Glassman. Maxwell has asserted in court filings and testimony in various civil cases that she worked for Epstein from 1999 until at least 2006. So that is the mechanism, the legal mechanism they're using to silence these survivors is by saying Maxwell worked for Epstein. She's on the record and you cannot go against an employee of Epstein. This is crazy. Um, <laughs> staffing and managing his properties in the US and Europe. She's denied under oath that she ever hired underage, blah, blah, blah. So Doan, the estate's lawyers have agreed to end the litigation, but Maxwell's legal team is objecting, just as they did early this month when Annie Farmer, another probable criminal trial witness, tried to dismiss her lawsuit after reaching a deal with the victim's program. In both cases, Maxwell's lawyers have argued that they require unredacted copies of the agreements the women reached with the program, including the amount of the settlement and documented proof that Maxwell is released from any 
future liability before they'll agree to end the lawsuits. In Doe's case, Maxwell's advocates went even further, asking the court to require Doe to pay Maxwell's legal costs for defending the civil suit. And in a letter to the court Tuesday, assailing the alleged victim's credibility in the most direct way since Maxwell's arrest in July, quote, Doe improperly, improperly brought this baseless civil suit against Miss Maxwell, making claims that are decades old over and over again. They're decades old, they're 25 years old, as if an assault on a teenager just disappears over time. Without a shred of doc, go on, go on, Fred, yep. Yeah, well, I, I want to add to that is that she's better hurry because I, I was looking into the uh, the compensation funds in terms of the date, because obviously this is not a open bar for the next 10 years, you know, this is, there's a an entry to it and then there's an exit to it. So the effective date of the program was in June 20. Uh, 25th, 2020 this year. So that's when it all started. They were allowed to basically go for that uh, compensation scheme and to apply for it. But also what's important to understand is all new allegation, uh, allegations, sorry, must be registered no later than February, the 8th of February, 2021. So that is what we call the registration deadline. After that, if you don't have your file, or you don't have a foot in the door, you're out. Doesn't matter what crime, whatever you can prove, it's over. And then all claim must be filed no later than March 2021. Okay, so it gives us a good idea of when these guys are prepared to pay and when you need to be ready to receive your compensation. So that's giving the, the lawyers also a, a, a time frame as far as to as how long, you know, how, how long they have to work on this. So in sales in the stock market, they teach you there's a thing called urgency. By creating urgency, you know, people will make investments. It's, it's an old sales trick. Now, what they're doing here is we've got this hypothetical trial of Maxwell scheduled for the summer, but we've got this window of opportunity open for you to take compensation. So that is the sales trick, the urgency, because they know pressure them, they'll take that money before Maxwell ends up getting a trial postponed to after that final date whereby they have to have took the money by. That's that's my belief what's going on there. Hmm. All right. All right. Going going back to this article then. Um, it's decades old about a shred of documentary or corroborative support. Miss Maxwell denies it all. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so Glenn Maxwell is in prison and stands accused of aiding and abetting one of the worst sexual predators of our time. She's trying to pay her way out of prison by putting up over 28 million. This is from Glassman, the, 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 the lawyer. Now mm -hmm. she is inexplicably asking the judge to make a child rape victim pay for her attorney's fees and costs. It is unconscionable and sad. This is how big a psychopath this super predator is. <laughs> Doe alleged in, law, in a lawsuit filed six months before Maxwell arrest that she was first approached by Epstein and Maxwell when she was 13 at summer arts camp in Michigan. Alleged in her complaint, she was sexually abused over several years by Epstein in his homes in Florida, New York, New Mexico. She would often travel to those locations of Epstein and Maxwell and one of the private jets. Quote, Epstein's system of abuse was facilitated in large by his co-conspirator and accomplice Maxwell, who helped supply him with a steady stream of young and vulnerable girls. And now they're pulling every legal trick in the book out to silence yeah, those yeah. girls one way or another. But we have all these brave survivors that are just pushing forward for it left yeah, and right well, what's funny is the time they've chosen as far as the accusation against uh, maxwell you know i personally believe you know anybody that has done some investigation will say that this has been going on for a long long time i believe there was a culture of uh, sadism a culture of uh, you know um, extortions ex um, you know, sequestrations. It's, it's been going on for a long, long, long time. And we're only seeing a snapshot, you know, in this uh, 
Epstein, G uh, Gisela, and Maxwell case, you know, but uh, this is much bigger than that. This has been going on for a long time, and they're, they are part of a, a, a patterns, you know, of some They've just took cover, maybe, you know, <laughs> of, of other people doing it before them. And I think a lot of people, a lot of researchers have suggested uh, Roy Kahn and all these guys, you know, they, they just took cover, you know, but this has been going on. This is a machine. And uh, I, more you dig in, more you find out that these people, it, it goes back and back more you dig in. Yesterday, I was talking to Tizia uh, Huisman in, uh, in Holland. And uh, in the conversation, she told me, but I bumped into Epstein in a nightclub at the Rex, <laughs> at the Rex in Paris in 1991. And guess who was at the table? Jean-Luc Brunel. She cannot recall Ghislaine Maxwell, but if she's there, Ghislaine Maxwell is there. There is no doubt about it. She just didn't know her, but she she definitely recognized Epstein being with Jean-Luc Brunel in 1991 in Paris. So when people are asking when these guys met, <laughs> you, you see, I was in 1996. They met before. So wow. you see, it's that more you're finding out, more you realize what is going on and how big this thing is. And she's a psychopath, and she's been a psychopath from a very, very young age. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. And uh, the stunt they put with this um, compensation fund has actually just pulled the form. In. Like if you're a victim, for example, what they do is they send you a form that you have to fill so that you can explain to them what you went through. And I have the forms in front of me. I was expecting like 20 pages at least. <laughs> it's literally two pages. I mean, it's four pages document, but really two pages that are addressed to the victims. That's just show you how much they care about the victims, because I can tell you, I can find much more questions than that to get to the bottom, you know, to get the truth out of them, to get to the bottom of it, you know. But it's very, very simple, you know, and uh, I, I'm looking into it when they're asking, for example, the victim, please specify locations, the traits of the abuse, the best of your ability. Please describe the circumstances under which you met first uh, Jeffrey Epstein. When did you the abuse uh, occur? Please specify this. What uh, age was the claimant when uh, the abuse began? On how many separate occasions did the abuse occur? You know, it goes around it, but it doesn't say who was there. Was he any witness? Were you talking to anybody? It's just about Epstein because Epstein is dead. So it's irrelevant, all the questions they're asking. They're not asking anything about the surrounding. And then that's what we know. It's a stunt. All right. So I'm going to go back then to the reasons that Maxwell thought she could be released. Things had changed. And we're going to get into the financial side of it now. Into, more, into details that I've not seen before. This is the first time I've read this stuff. So it starts with the proposed bail conditions. Miss Maxwell now proposes the following 28.5 million bail package, which is exceptional in its scope and puts at risk everything that Miss Maxwell has. <laughs> all, all of her and her spouse's assets, her family's livelihood, and the financial security of her closest friends and family if she were to flee, which she has no intention of doing. <laughs> a 22.5 million personal recognizance bond co-signed by Miss Maxwell and her spouse and secured by approximately 8 million in property and 500,000 in cash. As noted in the financial report, the 22.5 million figure represents the value of all of Miss Maxwell and her spouse's assets. The three properties securing the bond include all of the real property that Miss Maxwell and her spouse own in the US, including the primary family residence. Five additional bonds totaling approximately 5 million co-signed by seven of Miss Maxwell's closest friends and family members. The individual bonds are in the amounts that would cause significant financial hardship to these sureties if Maxwell were to flee. These include 1.5 million co-signed by redacted, both US citizens and residents secured on their residence. 3.5 million co-signed by redacted UK citizens and residents. Um, 25,000 co-signed redacted US citizen, 25,000 bond, redacted, um, looks like that is in US, 
a 2000 bond, close family friend, US citizen and resident, fully secured 2000 cash. Then a 1 million bond posted by the security company that will provide security services to Miss Maxwell if she is granted bail and transferred to restrictive home confinement. The bond is significant as we are unaware of a security company ever posting its own bond in support of a bail application. The head of the security company has confirmed that they have never done this for any client and that he's willing to do so for Miss Maxwell because he's so confident that she will not try to flee. So I have never heard of that either, Fred. And if you've got the connections that she's got and you know, this could be some kind of front company, this security company run by intelligence agency apparatus. So she could have this down on the legal paperwork to say this extraordinary thing is happening. Um, what's your take on that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's as I said, you know, it refers to when she was uh, arrested in uh, in the talk to a mention, she used uh, this uh, security apparatus, you know, to ensure a security now is more to that. I think they, they, there's the fact that her, she's watched and I think she's, uh, uh, you know, she has a presence around her, not only to protect her, but to watch over her every single move, what she's doing. And uh, I think this is where the intelligence presence here, it does not appear as an intelligence outfit. It's just basically a, a security company, but that security company has a very, very pe peculiar mission as far as I'm concerned. They're from Britain, they are UK people. Uh, she's very attached to the UK. She grew up there, she did not grow up in France. And uh, she uh, she's more Brit than she's a French, if you will. And I think that she's definitely has some, uh, a, a huge amount of information with regards to Andrew. So when you hear about security with Gisela Maxwell, think about more about what she knows about Andrew, how much she knows about crown secrets, because these are crown secrets at the end of the day. And there's no way they're gonna let her in the nature anywhere without, as soon as she gets out, or if she were to get out, she will be uh, obviously controlled and taken care of by uh, these uh, security apparatus that belongs to the crown. That's just that's all I can explain it because they have no reason to be there. She has the money to uh, um, to pay any any uh, American, you know, <laughs> J-Cat <laughs> kind of guys, you know, Jared that will take care of her better than anybody else, you know. So she's uh, she's got this British crown, British crown intelligence apparatus watching over uh, every single move because of a knowledge of Prince uh, of Prince Andrews and what he did and how this whole thing was organized, you know. That's the only reason I can explain it. Wow, that's absolutely mind-blowing, Fred. So just to recap on what you said then, you're saying that Prince Andrew and the royal family have got her locked down in terms of security because of all of the information she has about them. And we know that Maxwell, when she was a university student, she'd already established that relationship with Prince Andrew. We know from her royal protection from Prince Andrew's Royal Protection Cop, Paul Page, who's interviews on this channel, that when Maxwell showed up, she, had, she was able to violate the Royal Security Protocol. And if any of the underlings called Andrew out on that or tried to prevent Maxwell from going up to see Prince Andrew, Andrew got on the phone and he was like, F this, F that, don't you know who I am? Let that person through. So she has got a wealth of information on the royal yeah. family going back decades. So that would yeah. be the motive for a special British uh, security apparatus uh, company to pop up over there in America and to bodyguard this woman and to offer that unique case of the bond. Yes, it's a, it's a matter of priority and national security. So if you protect something, it's going to be the information before the asset. But since the asset and the information are not kind of, you know, separated, then they have to protect the assets. That, that's what it is. So 
Now, the question is, and I, this is where great investigation is required, is to understand who was responsible to retrieve that information that they were collecting on people, because this will give us an extremely, you know, we, we will jump, you know, in, in the inquiry, we'll be able to make huge progress if we understand really how much do they actually have on people and how this information was developed, you know, uh, channeled to, to the appropriate uh, handling uh, person. Who was the handler? What is the contents? And who benefited from that? How many within the intelligence community had access to this very, very expensive knowledge? And I think everybody's protecting that. The UK is definitely protecting Gisled Maxwell. Whatever she's going to do, she's going to be protected. But unfortunately, she is in the MCC in Brooklyn. She's not going anywhere, and there are very little power there. They're just waiting, and they're trying to get her out. All right, going on to the page nine of this document now, then. Miss Maxwell will remain in the custody of Redacted, a U.S. citizen who has lived in the U.S. for 40 years will serve as Maxwell's third party custodian and will live with Maxwell in a residence in New York City until this case has concluded. We have identified an appropriate residence in the Eastern District of New York that has been cleared by Maxwell's security company. So do you have any uh, idea of who this US citizen that's going to be the custodian is <laughs> that came I was really naked I was like who the hell is it going to be no I have no idea I I really have no idea so I can't I can't tell you your guess will be as good as mine all right next we don't item know. We don't know. next item on page nine travel mm -hmm. restricted to the southern and eastern districts of New York and limited as necessary to appear in court attend meetings with counsel and visit with doctors, psychiatrists, dentists upon approval by the court or pretrial services. Surrender all travel documents with no new applications like that means anything to Maxwell. Maxwell will provide the court irrevocable written waivers of a right to consent extradition, to contest extradition in France and the UK, strict yeah. supervision by pretrial services. Home confinement at her residence with electronic GPS monitoring. Visitors to be approved in advance by pretrial services with counsel and family members to be pre-approved. Such other terms as the court may deem appropriate under 18. Do you reckon Maxwell has the skill set to get out of a electronic ankle bracelet, Fred? Well, if she doesn't have it, uh, trust me, the people that she will be surrounded will say, absolutely no problem whatsoever to, you know to uh, appear that she was there when she's already you know having a jacuzzi and uh, sipping on a nice port you know back in the uk you know so no I, look it's it's the whole thing is a is a is a is a blubber it's a it's a nonsense and it's just basically trying to put meat on the bone where there's actually no bone you know so it's a waste of time and that's exactly what what you're saying here they're prepared to give everything and when they do that is because they know that the first moment she's in the house of arrest then the intelligence will do what we call an extraction and uh, she will be out before even you even realize it on the first night you can bet it for her own safety miss maxwell will also have on premises security guards 24 hours seven days a week they will prevent maxwell from leaving the residence at any time without prior approval by the court or pretrial services I will escort her when she is authorized to leave. If the court wishes to make private security a condition of a bond, the guards could report to pretrial services. We believe these conditions are more than sufficient to reasonably assure Miss Maxwell's presence in court. So that's how you sell the court on having an in-house extraction team. <laughs> nothing is that it seems, you know, nothing is what it seems, you know, you you can see MI6 going to the pre-trial services, so we're going to go for a coffee out there, can we have 10 cars and two helicopters, please? I mean, <laughs> guys out of your nuts, these guys are just, I mean, I couldn't stand a conversation with this dude, I say, yo, you're taking people for fools, you know, I mean, come on, this, this is obvious, anybody that is working this domain will tell you, this, this is just a, a charade, you know, <laughs> the pre-trial services, you know, with someone like Gisman Maxwell. Now she's not, 
she belongs behind bar because that's the only way she can, they can control her. They can save a life because that's what she needs to understand. Her life is in super danger right now. And a lot of people want to know what she knows. Uh, so, yeah, no, no, she's, she's, she's good where she is, you know. All right, going on to now the new information that Max Oppoport had come about. New information for the court's consideration. The defence has devoted substantial time and effort to compile information that was unavailable to Maxwell at the time of the initial bail hearing that squarely addresses each of the factors the court considered at that hearing. Because of these efforts, Miss Maxwell can now present the following additional information in support of her renewed bail app. Number one, letter from Miss Maxwell's spouse. And there's all kinds of rumors about this. This letter demonstrates that Maxwell has powerful family ties to the US that she will not abandon. It describes the committed relationship between Maxwell and her spouse, a US citizen, how they have lived a quiet family life together in the US for over four years, immediately prior to her arrest. The letter further explains that Maxwell was forced to leave her family and drop from the public eye, not because she was trying to evade law enforcement, oh, she would never do anything like that, but because the intense media frenzy and threats following the arrest and death of Epstein threatened the safety and well being of herself and her family. For these reasons, Maxwell's spouse did not come forward as a co signer at the time of the initial hearing. So she's just such a committed wife, having a quiet family life. She wouldn't dream of going on the run from the law. Uh, hasn't yeah. it come out that they were in the process of getting divorced? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, I don't understand. <laughs> it's one way they're telling you this is because this old paragraph, it's all about basically expressing uh, that she has ties with the United States. So they'll just put anything again, any meat on the bone to make it sounds kind of a reasonable. But then eventually they will announce that she uh, she will have to disclose that she's in the process of divorce. So it's, um, you know, probably a, a lie on one hand and a, a worse lie on the other hand. So there's no truth in any of that, you know, and that's, that's, that's why it's sickening that we see people spending hours redacting these documents and spending, you know, U.S. tax money on this garbage. You know, that's, that's for me, I find it sickening. And here's the next factor that's new information. Letters from numerous friends and family members these letters from Maxwell's other sureties and several family members and friends attest to her strong, forthright character and the confidence that she will not flee. The sureties also describe the significant financial distress they would suffer if Maxwell were to violate her bail conditions. Next factor. <laughs> financial, <laughs> financial report. Prepared by the accounting firm McCalvin's Limited. I've never heard of them. Have you heard of them, Fred? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of them. I do. I did pretty good too, you know. Where are they? they, they are? The Where are they? Well, they're just basically there to uh, to do the uh, the auditing of all the accounts and assets of Shislen Maxwell. So, I mean, you know, if you have nothing in life, you don't need these guys because it's going to go very quick. You know where your dollars are, you know, pretty much how much your apartments or your, your car, you know, is worth. But she needs an accounting firm to get to, to do the old, you know, auditing to see exactly how much she's worth and where the assets are. You're going to, you're going to see below. It's, it's very interesting. Provides an accounting of Miss Maxwell's financial condition from 2015 to 2020 and discloses all of her own assets, all assets held in trust, all of the assets held by her spouse over that same period. The report reflects that the total value of assets in all three categories is approximately 22.5 million, which is the amount of the proposed bond. Report from former IRS agent with over 40 years of experience in criminal tax and financial fraud investigations reviewed the McAlvin's report and confirmed that it prevents a complete and accurate picture of Maxwell and her spouse's assets. 
Statement from the person in charge of Maxwell Security, the extraction, head of the extraction team, rebuts the government's claim that she attempted to hide from law enforcement at the time of her arrest. Extradition waivers and expert affidavits. To address the court's concerns about extradition, Maxwell will present irrevocable written waivers of her right to contest extradition in both the UK and France. We provide opinions from experts in extradition laws of the French, France and UK, stating it's highly unlikely that Maxwell will be able to resist extradition from either country and eventually be granted bail and fled to either country, which she has no intention of doing. Their opinions also state that any extradition proceedings will be resolved promptly. Lack of corroborating evidence. Okay, so here's a fiendish plan now to buy off <laughs> the other witnesses with the and survivors and victims with the fund so that they can't corroborate the three people named or you know who are part of this uh, original indictment. So the government represented the court that it had contemporaneous documents including di ent diary entries in support of its case. The defense has now reviewed the discovery produced to date including all of the docs that the government described as the core of its case against Maxwell. As explained more fully below, the discovery contains no meaningful documentary corroboration as to Maxwell and only a small number of docs from the time period of the conspiracy charge and indictment. As an example, the government produced only redacted. The evidence in this case boils down to witness testimony about events that took place over 25 years ago. Far from creating a flight risk, the lack of corroboration only reinforces Maxwell's conviction she is falsely accused and strengthens her long-standing desire to face the allegations against her and clear her name in court. Now, there was all kinds of evidence found in the trash searches, including the notepad evidence. And Maxwell said she wasn't in certain um, buildings during certain times, but the notepad evidence completely contradicted that. Have you got anything to say about the notepad evidence, Fred? No, it's, uh, you know, it's again, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm a bit, bit boring today, but uh, everything that I read is just, I mean, any lawyers would just laugh at it, you know, it's just, uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. And uh, it's, everything impairs her ability to basically review uh, the, the documents. So that's what she fought for a long time, you know, to access the document, to have a, a fair a legal representation, to prepare a trial. That was at the beginning when she got arrested. And then it went on and on with the COVID-19, the outbreak, and, you know, the MDC threatens her safety or well-being. This is just what was all about. You know, they will use any single angle to try to basically get it out. And that's what this document is about. Anything you can find, they'll put it there as to add meat to the bone. That's it, there's just nothing else. And I, I can't really say anything else, you know, the, uh, I don't see anything to add to what they're saying because it's a pile of nonsense. So I don't want to add myself to that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let, me, let me see if we can get through this quicker then. Um, the next yeah. one is a whole paragraph that just basically says about the draconian conditions and the threat to her safety from Corona. And then the next one is a paragraph about all of the articles, the media articles that spiked when Epstein was arrested and I've still shown no signs of abating. And that's what we want. We are here so that this case will never abate. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're claiming that the articles exceeds the number of articles, including Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, El Chapo, um, Keith Rhaenyra in 90 days following their arrest. Her articles exceed all the articles on them combined. And combined. She, deser <laughs> she, she deserves it. She deserves <laughs> it. This is what you but get. Everything in this case is bigger. You know, this is like uh, the super burger, you know, out of the bigger burger you ever had. You know, <laughs> it's just, uh, I mean, look at the, 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 the bell for the bell hearing, how much money they were putting. I mean, it's unheard of, you know, the amount of money they were prepared to get it out. And we're going to believe you are made to believe this is money from a, 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 out of the, someone's heart or the, the family friends that comes together and say, oh, let's put a couple of 20 million. You know, they just put it out pop it out of the bag you know no this is just something is out there and they want it out and they want her out badly so that's what we're saying and then 
the case is big on all aspects. You know, as I say, it's uh, again, you know, it's uh, you can you can see it there, right there, what you just said. And then the next couple of pages are stuff that we've already gone over. So yeah. I'm just skipping ahead right now. Um, it doesn't look like there's anything new at all, even though they're claiming that that was all new stuff. They're saying that the reasons that the courts denied bail in the first place are as follows. Lack of significant family ties in the US. Lack of a clear picture of her finances. Circumstances of arrest, casting doubt. Maxwell being a citizen of France. Um, government's witness testimony will be corroborated, but they're saying that it's not been corroborated. But it's it, there's a whole section here about corroboration. But again, um, you know, it's months into her arrest. There's 1.2 million documents. There's more witnesses potentially to come forward. I imagine that there's going to be massive amounts of corroboration coming out at some point. Um, next page just talks about all the people, uh, the well-meaning people posting her bond, wonderful and loving people in quotation marks. Um, her devotion to her family and a desire to protect her mm. spouse from threats and harassment. Mm. Next page, a number of Maxwell's family and friends um, signing the bonds. Next page, she's posting her home up because she knows that in every fiber of her being that Mac Ms. Maxwell will never, ever try to flee. That's a quote from one of the loving and wonderful Posters of, of <laughs> um, then it gives loving person. gives gives the credentials then for the McAlvin's report and the certified fraud examiner, all of his expertise. Um, definitely not to be trusted if um, he's representing Maxwell. So it's it, the whole thing is just really beefing out the things that yeah. we've gone over in the first few pages. Yeah, yeah. I and to, especially, I think, in the, in the verbiage, you know, in, in, in documents like that, it's more about the tone, you know, that is, that is employed. And what I can see here is that she's in any, in any way, she, she's portrayed as a victim. And that, for me, that's where, where really I, I can't, I, it's, you know, it's, it's sickening, you know, because they're portrayed as a victim, that she's such a loving person. There's so many people that love her around the world. They're prepared to put so much money to get her out. She's so willing to go to trial, you know, to clear her name. Uh, you know, it's just, you know, she's been victimized all the way. And that's a strategy. Uh, and unfortunately, I think uh, if they were a bit smarter, they will change their strategy because it's not working for sure. Now, I'll have to put the link in this in the description box at some point because I think that some of the viewers might want to pour over the whole thing. And on page 25 of 45, there is actually an interesting chart. Ghislaine Maxwell Media Mentions 2015 to 2020. And um, it shows it was building up um, November 28, 2018, the Miami Herald article perversion of justice mm -hmm. caused a little bump. There was another bump a few months later. Well, then when Epstein got arrested, it went up to, it was peaking at around 300 new articles a day um, when Epstein died in between the arrest and the death. And then November, 2019, the Sun offered a 10,000 reward. And uh, I'll just read what it says in this document. The level of press coverage spiked in November 2019 when the British tabloid The Sun ran an advertisement offering 10,000 for information about Maxwell's whereabouts. And it continued at a heightened level over the next several months. The graph depicts in stark visual terms the sea change in media attention that upended Maxwell's life at the time of Epstein's arrest. It was not only harassment from the press that Maxwell suddenly encountered. She also faced a deluge of threatening messages on social media in the days immediately following Epstein's arrest and death. The hatred towards Maxwell in these posts is palpable and unsettling. 
despite the fact that she was not charged, you see not even mentioned in the Epstein indictment and not being charged with any crimes, the authors referred to her as a crazy paedophile pimp bitch. This is in quotation marks in this document and a subhuman C-U-N-T and call mm -hmm. for her to rot in jail. These people also encourage all manner of violent acts against Maxwell. For example, one post, quote, they need to get this B word and string her up by her neck, effing monster. Another stated, I hope someone finds her and kills her. That would be justice. Obviously her lawyers know where she is. Someone should stick them up to batteries until we find out where she is. These posts were particularly chilling because some of them suggested that the authors redacted might redacted carry out the violent acts they had been threatening. For example, in response to an August 14, 2019 news report that Maxwell might be living in Man Massachusetts, one person wrote, she's here in Massachusetts. The B word, Ghislaine Maxwell, who sex trafficked young girls for Epstein. Why the hell isn't she being brought in for questioning? We do not want her here, sleazy leech. She is close enough to me, I could grab her myself. The intense media attention and violent threats made it no longer for Maxwell to live a quiet life and required her to take more drastic steps to protect herself. Rather than see redacted harm by even more unwanted media attention, she made a difficult decision to separate herself and leave her home as her spouse right? So, so this is um, because it came out. So Maxwell said that she's got all these ties to the US. She's got a husband. And then it came out that she was getting divorced. So then she played the card that she was getting divorced to protect him from the media attention. Okay. And, uh, uh, that, that just sorry to barge in. Uh, uh, yeah, go Sean, ahead. Go for it. <laughs> on that one, I, I'll give just my opinion on that. But I think this was a play. Uh, I think her money is Bergeson is with Bergeson. Bergeson is not spending a penny on her. It's just basically putting her money out back in there, just you know, to uh, to help her out. But what she's, I think, doing is also probably allowing herself that to announce the divorce. You know, that they are in a, in a, in the process of divorce because if she wants to take that money out, that divorce will basically justify a money coming out of Bogus and back to her. So that's how she gets the money with a paper, a, a divorce paper. And so to legalize that money, and I believe that's why someone would do something like that. So it's, it's nothing to do to protect the husband, it's to legalize the transaction. So here's the staged correspondence with the spouse then, to justify this. As her spouse writes, what the report, on, Sean, sorry. I'm on page, so if you, look, if you look at the top of the document, it says page 26 of 45. But if you look at the yep. bottom of the document, it says page 20. Yeah, 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 I'm 26 now. Yeah, so I here, know there's two, two numbers, <laughs> 26, I got it. After so as her, as her spouse writes, the reporting of Ghislaine over the past year has exploded exponentially. From the time of Epstein's arrest and death in custody in the summer of 2019 until Ghislaine's own arrest in July of this year, huge and increasingly frightening levels of media interest meant redacted. There are many examples of violence whose seeds were born in conspiracy theories and the experiences of QAnon, Pizzagate, and the recent Judge Salas attack are terrifying. It is hard to communicate in words the feeling of being stalked, spied upon, and trapped by constant 24-7 media intrusion. Since, and then this is um, going back to the document, Maxwell had no choice but to separate itself from him. Since Maxwell's own arrest in July 2020, press attention exploded dwarving all the information given to all those other high-profile people we mentioned earlier. Yeah. And then, then we've got a new graph. We've got a Ghislaine Max. So number of media articles, um, 90 days after rest. So Keith Rainier had in the low hundreds. Chapo had 1,500. Bill Cosby had 2,000. Harvey Weinstein had 2,000. I'm going to ask people in the live chat right now. I have just gone over what 
these other people got. What do you think Maxwell got? 90 days after her arrest, all of the US media coverage, how many articles? Harvey Weinstein got 2,000. Bill Cosby got 2,000. Chapo got 1,500. Keith Rainier got a few hundred. Please put in the live chat right now, how many articles do you think Maxwell got over that 90 day period? And we are looking for a number in the thousands. We're coming in at 3,500. No. <laughs> no. Going, 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 gone. Going 4,500, no. Take, take it no. up, take it up a bit. 1,500, 23, no. It's, it's quite a lot. Keep going. 16,000, 25,500,000. 1. 1.2 million. Yeah. <laughs> Even Trump doesn't get that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's very funny. So, so, uh, 1,000, 1,000, million, million. All right. So, the total number for Maxwell was mm. just under 7,000. Good grief. Yeah. Well, long, eight, long, and long, long may they come. Long may they come. Yeah. She had a lot of attention. And the saying that she did not try to hide or flee from the government, as argued at the bail hearing. She was just on the, on the, she was just there with her extraction team. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm just skim reading ahead right now. Miss Maxwell did not try to avoid arrest. No, was she good at hiding? Um, according to the security guard on duty that day, that had seen helicopters flying over the house, which he had assumed to be the press. When the guard saw the FBI agents walking up the driveway to the house, he again assumed they were members of the press. He radioed Maxwell to alert her that the press was on the grounds and approaching the house. How plain clothes were these guys then to look like the press? Were they not like swatted up? Oh, these In are black helicopters, you know, you get no numbers, you get no nothing. It's, you know, it's, they don't appear, they don't exist. You know, these are people that are there to, to do something, to take care of an asset and its information. And uh, they will go to any expense. The money is not the issue. It's about making sure that they've been granted uh, some kind of a way to, you know, to get the job done. And if it means to look like price, they look like price. You know, and price see. is used a lot as a coverage, you know. Right, price and gotcha. <laughs> Okay. In accordance with the procedure that Maxwell security personnel had put in place for such an event... Maxwell moved away from the windows into a safe room in the house. She was not trying to avoid rest. She was following the established security protocol to prevent a press ambush. Yeah, I'm very curious about this cell phone wrapped in tinfoil. We explained <laughs> to the court at the initial bail hearing that Maxwell took this step to prevent the press from accessing her phone after the Second Circuit inadvertently unsealed certain court records with the phone number unredacted. Wouldn't you just get a new phone and change your number if the, if the court re revealed your, your number? Look, you know, I, I believe that she, these, kind of, you know, these kind of people are diluted. You know, they, they're playing you know, James Bond and James Girl, you know, they, they, they're watching too, too, too much movies. They, they, you know, we give them way, way too much credit. We give them way too much credit. The only reason why they got into all this is because there was plenty of money. There was money laundering and there was Papa Maxwell that allowed this entire charade to take place. And some people saw the value in that. They saw these guys who were not, I mean, Ghislaine Maxwell is not the smartest purple you, person you will ever meet in your life. She's not dumb, but she's far from being smart. I've listened to some of the conferences that she made during that Terama project and so on. What I'm hearing there is just, you know, slightly postgraduate kind of person, but I'm not hearing intelligence experience and someone that is, you know, flying very high, you know, among scientists and amongst, you know, uh, top intellectuals of this world. She's just a, a spoiled brat that gets caught doing something that she shouldn't have been done, mingling around the wrong people, and more importantly, 
doing the bidding of a couple of agencies that, you know, in the first place should have never entrusted her with anything. She was just a mean to an end. And we are seeing everything we say now is just a, it's just a, you know, I, I, I look at her as a delinquent, you know, young delinquent caught hand in the bag. With James Bond fantasies. So having now, fantasy. having now reviewed the discovery produced by the government, it is clear that Maxwell was not at all the master spy the government makes her out to be and was not wrapping the phone in order to evade detection by law enforcement. First, the cell phone in question was subscribed in the name of Terramar Project, Inc. I've done some uh, research and videos on Terramar, which is easily identifiable through a simple Google search as Maxwell's charity. Maxwell used the phone to make calls as late as May 2020, just before arrest. She would never have used the phone if she had been concerned that the authorities were using it to track her. Third, Maxwell had another phone subscribed in the name of GMAX that she was using as a primary phone, which was not covered. It would make no sense for her to try to wrap one phone in tinfoil to avoid detection and not the other. Indeed, the discovery reflects that it was not hard at all for the government to locate Maxwell when they wanted to find her by tracking her primary phone. In sum, the phone clearly shows that Maxwell was not good at hiding or that she was avoiding arrest, as the government claimed. <laughs> she was trying to protect herself as best she could from harassment by the press, not captured by law enforcement. Moreover, this should not be a bar to granting bail. The proposed conditions ensure presence at home in plain sight of and the security guards, blah, blah, blah. Well, she does have a unique skill set, doesn't she, that um, if she had delusions of being a James Bond character, I mean, she's got a license to pilot underwater submarines and robots and speaks all these different languages and has all these connections. So you can see, you know, her, 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 she would have some value in the intelligence agency community through all that. Well, you know, Sean, I, I, I like the idea of it and, you know, it's very entertaining, but unfortunately I believe that uh, this is really a, a big myth and it started with Jeffrey Epstein and uh, the people that have been very close to Jeffrey Epstein have told that Jeffrey has always that, um, that kind of desire, you know, that desire to be mysterious, to be that <laughs> kind of a James Bond, you know, that have access to so many things that can do so many things, you know, almost miracles, but a very discreet and very understated kind of person, but leaving the mystery out there. So you're the one that completes the story. And I think Ghislaine Maxwell was exactly, you know, rubbing off that and uh, she she got that kind of verbiage and dialogue as to not really saying who she was what she was doing but implying that she was you know a lot more than she actually was uh, and and as i said again you know it's just i'm not trying to undermine the role she played in any of that but i think there's a lot of fantasy in 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 all this that that's for sure is are not the smartest people on earth and they are very very sloppy you know they they, they leave marks behind there's way too much marks you know these are if they were proper intelligence people you would not be, be able to track any of the assets any of that you know this is very sloppy work this is amateur time so the next several pages just talk about why she would not be on the run to other countries and extradition. Then the next several pages talk about the lack of corroboration in the discovery. And then we go on to the proposed bail package is expansive and far exceeds what is necessary to assure Maxwell's presence in the court. And there's a nice blue chart um, that's got all of the things ticked off on it to compare it with people who were granted bail bonds versus the what Maxwell is proposing and how safe and sure she is. So again, I'm gonna put this whole thing in the description box when we finish this live stream so that um, people can go over this themselves and read all of these details. And then we're at the conclusion Ghislaine Maxwell is committed to defending herself and wants nothing more than to remain in this country where her family and friends are by her side so she can fight the allegations against her and clear her name. She's determined to ensure that her sureties and her family do not suffer by breaching her bond. We are presented a substantial bail package that satisfies the concerns of the court and the government. More than ample security and safeguards um, to show, ensure she'll remain in New York and appear in court. The court has the obligation to ensure that the defendant's constitutional right to prayer defense is safeguarded. 
the correct and only legitimate decision is to grant Maxwell bail on the proposed strict <laughs> conditions. For the foregoing reasons, Miss Maxwell res respectfully requests that the court order her release on bail pursuant to the condition she has proposed. So the correct, so they're telling the judge what to do. And the judge said, I'll decide. Bam! No bail hearing. Stay in there on your, your entire floor. The verbiage is that uh, is just say it all, you know, this entitlement and basically almost directing the judge, up, as you said, you know, to, you know, this is the, the right things to do, you know, for everyone, you know, just let it go. Uh, you see what the only winners in, in this entire thing so far are the lawyers. I mean, they, they are stashing up some serious money. They're coining nicely with this uh, because, I mean, I mean, if they are capable of just for, you know, for bail to put 20, 30 grams uh, 30 million dollars on the table and more then you know you know that the lawyers are just this is pay time you know this is you want to be involved it doesn't matter how, how close you get to maxwell but you want to be in that case because there's money you're going to get paid you know so uh they are the big winners in that and i think that what we are seeing in this document is just the lawyers justifying his big paycheck you know but there's no I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the judge didn't even, probably she went to the conclusion pretty quickly because the decision was already made. There's nothing has changed. It's just blah, blah, blah. But there's no, nothing actually they can, that can sustain and that can explain, you know, uh, a bail hearing and eventually a decision to let it go. So she was never near to get out. And I'm glad she, you know, the decision was made. All right, in. huge, huge thank you to all people on the live stream then. For over two hours now, we have chatted about, digested, ruminated over all the docs that have surrounded the decision that just came out today by the court. It wasn't an actual hearing that we could listen to the audio of. The judge just made a ruling that the motion was denied for Maxwell to have a new bail bond hearing because nothing has changed, even though Maxwell put out all these pages and pages of stuff that she is claiming has changed. We've looked at the farcical um, bloody relationship with the husband, how he was the anchor to the country, but she, they were about to get divorced. But they're only about to get divorced because of all the media publicity she was protecting him. So it's just smoke and mirrors. And you've been so gracious, Fred, with your time again today. Um, I do you, do you want to answer some questions to the people? Or do you have to get going now? Uh, I'm probably going to get going um, unless you okay. have uh, questions. Like as I said, I've I've spent most of my time focusing on, over the last past, especially three months, you know, on Jean Luc Brunel to make sure we can get him behind bars uh, before Christmas. So that has taken pretty much most of my time, and there's so many other subjects that are that I really want to dig in. Uh, as I said, this is nice. I, I'm really enjoying that chat because we can have a bit of laugh as well. It doesn't have to be always sad, you know, and uh, we can. Uh, really interprets uh, and understands uh, what's the mind because this is all about understanding the mindset of Shislin Maxwell and the defense team what kind of fight they're going to put up what we're going to get you know what is going to be the defense strategy and so far what I'm seeing is desperation to get her out so that's the strategy now they're not getting it they're not getting their way with getting her out what's going to be January's move we're going to see a series of motion back-to-back -back motions that's the normal process with lawyers they're going to basically put the government under huge amount of pressure just trying to get anything out of that to make to have the government to make somehow, somewhere a mistake. But uh, it's not looking good for Gislaine Maxwell. And I'm, I'm glad it is that way. I'm going to keep on focusing on now on that side of the Atlantic, because I think the real debate now is uh, we're missing one big name, and that is Prince, Prince Andrew. Prince Andrew needs to be, needs to be, uh, needs to start talking it needs to really start to come forward doesn't matter his titles because at this moment in time not only is ruining 
you know, what the uh, royal family of England has left as a reputation, because they've been involved in so many things. I mean, no disrespect, you know, I have a lot of respect for Britain and the people of Britain, but the royal family, it's just, you know, I just can't, I just can't, you know, understand why they have been, you know, people have been sponsoring them for so long, so long when they are bringing so little to you guys, you know. So here we go. This is disrespect. They have these are psychopath. I think Andrew is one of them. He's a spoiled kid. And he is, was involved in that. Ghislaine Maxwell knows about it. Jean-Luc Brunel knows about it. And it's about the time that he talk. And that's where I want to put all my effort over the next uh, few days is to try and to understand how we can uh, get him to talk and put him under pressure. All right. So huge thank you for your time today, Fred. What I'll do is I'll just stay on, answer a few questions, and I'll, I'll um, take you off the Zoom in a second. But I just want to urge everybody to go down in the description box, support your work, fantastic results. And Fred's on Twitter. If you want to message him, uh, follow him down there and retweet. There's going to be Twitter handles also for some of the survivors in the description box. It's a time of celebration and congratulations for all of them. Oh, my camera battery just went. Hold on one second while I just um, replace this. We spoke no, for we so... are for you, Sean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is uh, Sean Atwood. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I shaved very quickly, you know? <laughs> I would love to come out, come over there and meet you, Fred, at some point when all this lockdown stuff has, has yeah, been lifted. Yeah. You're not, not so far away on that um, express train that goes through the tunnel, the channel there. Um, so, yeah, so if you, it, wherever you are in the world, please go down. Support Fred's work. If you've got any questions, I, I see a load of questions coming in. I'm going to move yep. over to those now. Let me see Fantastic. how I yeah. can. I'll answer um, all the questions. You know, if you have any questions, that divert, divert it to them. I really have to go. Unfortunately, it's been two hours and uh, I've got two yeah. things that I need to catch up with. But uh, look, if there's any questions, come on to the channel. I try to answer all the messages because I don't have, uh, like Sean, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, <laughs> uh, subscribers. So I have to, still a bit of time to answer all the questions. And uh, it's really my pleasure to do so. So again, thank you very much. I've also, just a special thanks, I've opened a PayPal and I've seen people sending me money. I've never received money for any works that I've done online. So absolutely amazing. You know, people have wished me Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And I, you know, I, I had no right to expect any, any, anything from you. So thank you so much for those that I did. I really appreciate Sean. Thank you very much indeed for your invitation. It's always a, a pleasure to be on your show and I will be seeing you very soon. Please email me the link to your PayPal. I'll put that down there as well. I will. Thank you very right. much. Cheers, cheers, Bye, everybody. Right. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. You. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay. That is Fred out of the live stream. And I'm just going to go over to the questions right now, see what's going on. All right. I'm supposed to be doing a live stream at 6 p.m. UK, which is just under two hours, with OG Shadow on how the Mexican cartels are functioning during lockdown. But also I was given permission by Kirby Summers, Epstein survivor, to discuss one of her research articles, really fascinating, tying the money laundering Iran Contra going way back to Maxwell's dodgy deals and how that spider's web, you know, the CIA intelligence agencies, they siphon that money from the cartels to do black ops. And that's ongoing to this day because Kirby links it to El Chapo. And I know that some of El Chapo's guys have tried to use that as a defense, saying that they were working for the feds, buying all these weapons, making all these profits. So just looking over... Oh, OG Shadow just sent me a message on Skype. So he is confirmed for tonight at six, which is one hour, 45 minutes from now, wherever you are around the world. So I'll just look at a few questions and then have a rest before the next live stream. Thank you, John Doe. And um, for the donation in the chat there, people are asking why, the, why she hasn't been suicided yet. And I think that there is still the possibility of that because they know, we know they suicided Epstein and 
they've got nothing to lose from us knowing if she gets suicided, it's not, nobody believes that Epstein did that to himself, but perhaps the fix that they're hoping for is that the plea bargain will be agreed with Maxwell, should keep her mouth shut, go to prison, do her time, get on with her life. I'm getting asked by short order court, why would Maxwell's lawyer want her out on bail? She would be safer kept inside. Is going for bail something in her favor, even if they don't want bail? So anyone who is a pre-trial detainee, an unsentenced prisoner, we call it on remand in the UK, because the conditions are usually quite intense in pre-trial detention, you often, let me just put my battery back on for the next stream, you often get people trying to fight their case outside of the jail. You have a right to defend yourself. And if you're just holed up in some hellhole place with cockroaches and it's hard to get visits and hard to make phone calls, if you're actually in your own home, you know, you've got access to pick up the phone whenever you want, to read in whatever paper what you want, your computer, your internet, you're far more equipped to prepare your defense. So many, I would imagine most pre-trial detainees, lawyers want to get them out on bail. It makes the whole situation much easier, including the complication of having to visit someone in a jail facility versus that person just shows up at your law offices. I don't think it's a, a safety consideration. You're asking if it's a safety consideration. The fact that Epstein was killed in a, pres uh, in a jail nearby uh, indicates that the risk to her life if they want to take her out is high at any point. Um, is going for bail something in a favor even if they don't want bail? Yeah, so for those reasons, pretrial detainees um, would want to get bailed out. Do I think that John Luke Brunel will sing? Same question could be asked about Maxwell. It depends upon what sentencing range they offered them when it comes to the final negotiations of the plea bargain. If Maxwell's sentencing range is five to 10, she may just thank goodness that she's not coming in in the 30 to 35 range and agree to sign that and get on with her life. If it comes in at 25 to 35, then she could say to hell with it, I'm either going to name names or I'm gonna roll the dice and take it to trial. And you see people quite often, they offer the plea bargain. There was a case in Arizona where the guy, I think he was offered about a 15 year plea bargain. And he said to hell with that, I'm gonna take it to trial, roll the dice, that's way too long. And he ended up getting 200 years. Now, the reason they give you these huge headline making sentences is not because you're gonna live that long, but because the prosecutor makes headline news, she gets a promotion, but then there's a deterrent effect on the inmate population. If you are another prisoner in that jail and you're thinking about rolling the dice because you got offered a 15 year plea bargain and you just see that Joe Smith just got 200 years for doing the same thing, that stops you in your tracks. And why do they not want to go to trial? Because if everything went to trial, the system would collapse. In Arizona, for example, state, 98% of the cases go to plea bargain. It costs tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, death penalty cases, millions to take someone to trial. If all those 98% of cases that went to plea bargain exercise their right, constitutional right to have a trial, the whole justice system will collapse. So if you do not bow down to them telling you you must sign a plea bargain and you go to trial, you no longer get all your sentences running at the same time. They stack them. So the guy who got the 200 years, for example, could well have had 20 charges, max sentence 10 years each, super aggravated on each one, and then stacked. So they all run one after the other. And that is to make an example for the rest of the inmate population to cow down and to not exercise their right to go to trial. So it's at the point of plea bargaining power right before the trial date is imminent 
are when these plea bargains are struck and the decision will be made whether to throw over people under the bus. John Luke Brunel, Maxwell, I both have that exact same dilemma right now. So Lala T, um, how do they justify all of her accommodations? So they're trying to justify Maxwell's accommodations by saying that she is under imminent threat of you know, death or suicide because of what happened to Epstein. She has to be kept away from the inmate population. She has to be monitored constantly and the guards have got to come in and check that she's still breathing. Pan Elf is asking who is behind this and why? Um, well, not sure specifically what you're asking is behind, but we believe that the whole Epstein case was the tip of an iceberg of an international intelligence agency apparatus involved, not just in trafficking, but also drugs, money laundering. It is the divisions of government that are able to coexist with criminal fraternity and are able to commit crimes. And then when these crimes ever get discovered, the intelligence agencies come in and tell the prosecutors, hey, we're calling the shots here. We've got the most power. It's in the interest of national security for you to, for example, release this person. You see often drug traffickers tied to the CIA. Often they come in and they get released or you've got to you know, give this person a deal, a, a special plea bargain deal so that they don't have to pay massive consequences. Sometimes the intelligence agencies double cross the people working for them and allow them to be criminalized or wholeheartedly get them criminalized because then they know if they ever blow the whistle on the operation, then the fact that they are a convicted criminal means that their testimony will be worthless. There's a uh, brilliant book by Terry Reed who was involved with Barry Seal and um, compromised. If you want to, and Terry Reed worked for the CIA and he discovered the drug trafficking. And if you don't believe that that um, that exists, Terry Reed just absolutely details it. And they went after him wholeheartedly, tried to kill him, tried to criminalize him, um, but he did emerge fr through it. And um, he, he wrote this book, Compromised. Yeah, so uh, check it out. It's available, I believe, worldwide on Amazon. Looking at, at the other questions here, um, just a few comments about all of the people um, that are attacking the channel right now. And as far as I'm concerned, that just shows that we're right over the target. Ever since we have been covering the Epstein case, the attacks on the channel just built and built and built. The attack started around the time my first podcast guest, Jamie Morgan Kane. And um, so there's a whole range of forces pitted against what we are doing here. But it, it just justifies the mission. And um, I'm not backing down. These things need to be out in the open. And the world, you know, with the mainstream media the way it is, it's, it's, it's people like Sonia Poulton, you know, the excellent work that's going on over on BNT, and Anna Breeze, who recently lost her YouTube channel for speaking out, um, Ryan Dawson, who's been, you know, had various platforms come and go. He had to go to Google in Ireland and protest outside of the Google offices to try and get his channel put back up. Um, all of these people, even the other prison channels, are under massive attacks right now. And I think that because of the thing going around the world, the virus, it's put a stress test on everybody, health, relationships, work. And this stress test is starting to cause a lot of people to crack up. And one of the ways that they're trying to get that stress out of their systems by attacking other people. Prison is a microcosm of society. And when prisoners go under sustained lockdowns, they start to crack up and they start to like, just talk a lot of trash. There's more violence and more attacks. So as these lockdowns proceed, 
I just expect more of this crazy behavior because um, I'm seeing it absolutely everywhere. My contemporaries are experiencing it as well. And um, a lot of, I've, I've had all this love and support coming in recent months while I've been under these attacks from people who have supported me because my best mate from childhood, Wildman, died. And now that he's up there, I could feel his strength just telling me, just keep going, expose these people and um, just let all these criticisms roll off your back and don't even give the idiots trying to make views off your name the time of the day. All right, so it's half past now. I should probably take a break before my next live stream, which is coming in an hour and a half with OG Shadow. We're gonna be talking about the Mexican cartels and not just what's going on right now during lockdown, but also the link to the Kirby Summers article. I am one of her Patreons. Um, she has a Patreon uh, page that people go to. And she does these really uh, comprehensive, well-researched pieces on the Epstein case, but she's linking it to the Mexican cartels and even to stuff with the intelligence agencies in Chapo. So my world, I mean, the Epstein case has been the biggest thing on this channel. Um, the cartels is the biggest thing on OG Shadow's channel. So both of our worlds coming together in this discussion, we're going to be having in exactly one hour, 30 minutes from now. So I hope everybody's had a great Christmas. Huge thank you to all of the subscribers, almost at 600K subscribers right now, which is a big F you to all the people trying to destroy the channel. Um, subscription log is in the bottom right hand corner and in the description box are all the links to my stuff, Fred's stuff, donation links and I'll also put the links in there to the documents we have been discussing today on this live stream. Um, did some massive collaborations in the past month and they are going to be published on YouTube on the channels in January. And I can't wait to announce these things, but they're secret right now. We've also got uh, a whole range of new ideas and guests coming up. And my right-hand guy, my guest book at Ash, thank you to your suggestions. He has 600 guests in his database waiting now that could potentially be coming on the channel. So endless and endless um, content coming in 2021 but let me go and rest my voice thank you again everyone for being on this live stream today more huge news as we take down super predator after super predator and i just think the good news is going to continue into 2021 and we hope to be some of the first to report it take care out there cheers from london thanks for watching